All right, the mole. So who knows this number, this mole number? What is that number? Yeah. And what does that mean? We call this number Avogadro's number. It's a huge number, right? This is kind of it spelled out. An enormous, almost, almost unimaginable number of things. To give you a sense of the size of that number, just a couple examples. A mole of seconds is four billion years, right? four million times the entire existence of the Earth. Uh, a mole of marbles would cover the entire surface of the country to a depth of 70 miles up. So anything that has any sort of tangible mass or amount or time, you can't really use that number because it just creates an unimaginably huge number of things. But when we're talking about something almost unimaginably tiny, like an atom, this number is actually kind of useful. So here's, here's the relationship, and this is what we use it for. And if, if this isn't making sense, we'll do some problems in a second that will hopefully clear it up a little bit. Here's kind of the key. The mass of one mole of an element is equal to its atomic mass in grams. Now before we break that down, what does it mean to have one mole of an element? What does it mean to have one mole of carbon, let's say? What do you actually have if you have one mole of carbon? Well, yeah, we have that many atoms of carbon. So you gather this many atoms, and you have one mole. All right. So mole isn't a unit. It's not like a measurement. It's simply a number. If you have a mole of something, you have this many of that things of that thing. So you can have a mole of seconds, a mole of marbles, you can have a mole of element of, of atoms, you can have a mole of molecules, whatever. Um, and for that reason, it's often compared to, and I think this is helpful, compared to a dozen. Does anybody, have you all heard of that term, a dozen? How many is in a dozen? Twelve. 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 All right. So they're exactly comparable. If you have a dozen of something, you have twelve of them. If you have a mole of something, you have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of them. All right. So it's simply a quantity. How many of this thing do you have? Now, a dozen is less useful for atoms because they're so small. So a dozen atoms wouldn't really be much. And a mole is not so useful for donuts because that would be delicious but a lot of donuts. It would probably be like more donuts than are even possible with all of the ingredients on the earth or something like that. Um, so that's the relationship that I always recommend and that I think about when I try to, when I forget about moles or what a mole means. It's just a number. The reason that we kind of emphasize that is that it's pretty different from everything else we talk about. A gram isn't a number. If you have a gram of something, that doesn't tell you you have a particular number of them that tells you you have a particular mass. Right? You measure out on the, on the scale, you measure out a gram. Same thing with something like a liter. A liter is a measurement. It's not a number. It's a quantity. Um, but a mole is a number. It's just an amount of things that you have. So that's why I think it gets a little bit confusing, a little bit tricky. But if you keep this relationship in mind, Hopefully that will help it be a little bit clearer. So there are that many atoms or molecules in one mole. So one mole contains that many. That's the identity that we can put into the uh, factor label things, the um, dimensional analysis, to convert things between moles and atoms. Now let's go back to that statement that I circled and look at the rest of it. The mass of one mole of an element is equal to its atomic mass in grams. How did we find atomic mass? Or how do you determine atomic mass? Yeah, on the periodic table, right? It's that, that number on the bottom in red on that table. So one atom of carbon we talked about, we can say that that weighs 12.011 atomic mass units, right? All right, well, a mole of carbon then weighs 12.011 
grams. So the mole allows us to convert from atomic mass units, which we can't really measure because they're too small, to grams, which we absolutely could measure. So you could measure 12.011 grams, right? That'd be a little dish full or so of carbon. And then you know if you did that, that you would have exactly that many atoms of carbon because you would have one mole of carbon atoms. All right. Well, why is this important? A couple of reasons. So before we get into all this, actually, I'm going to pull up the next. All right, so the picture I'm looking for, we'll come, we'll come up later, um, has a, a thing about pizzas with relationship to um, a chemical reaction. But I'm just going to look at it in terms of a chemical reaction. So here's a simple chemical reaction. I'm going to draw out these molecules. This is the reaction formed from dissolving HCl, which is hydrochloric acid, in water. If you do that, you get something like this. And we'll talk about what this means later when we get into reactions. The point I want to make with in respect to moles is that you'll notice that what's reacting here are individual molecules reacting with each other. In fact, you can actually draw specifically how these things react, which is something that we do in organic chemistry, where we actually show an arrow showing that that oxygen takes that hydrogen and, and the, this bond electron goes back to the chlorine. Don't worry too much about that. But the idea is that individual molecules react with each other. So it's not the mass that we care about, right? The mass of water or the mass of HCl. Those aren't reacting together. They're the individual molecules. You need one molecule of water for each molecule of HCl for this reaction to work. If you have a bunch of extra water but still just the one molecule of HCl, you still just get the one set of products and still a bunch of extra water. This is why the mole is important, because molecules react with each other one to one or two to one. They react in a specific ratio, molecule to molecule. So if we just use the mass, like if we say, all right, I want to react one gram of water with one gram of HCl, you're not going to get a full reaction because one gram of water and one gram of HCl does not necessarily mean the same number of molecules of each of those. In fact, it's going to be a different number of molecules for each of those. And we're going to talk about how you figure that out. So we need to use the mole to make sure that we convert from mass, which is the quantity that we measure, to a number, which is, the quant which is what actually reacts, the actual numbers of molecules. And that's why this is important. So let's practice how we actually do the calculation. So you got 10 grams of aluminum. How many moles of material are there? And then how many aluminum atoms are there in that quantity? So what you have to do is take your 10 grams and do some conversions using those unit factors. So we're going to use the same procedure that we've been using all along. 10 grams of aluminum. And we're going to multiply that by what we call the molar mass, which is just the amount of mass that's in one mole. So we look at the periodic table, and you see aluminum element 13. Uh, 26.9, which is going to be 27.0. So that means that in one mole of aluminum, there are 27.0 grams of aluminum. All right, so that's our conversion factor. That tells us how many grams are in the mole are in each mole. So we can cancel our grams of aluminum, and we now have moles of aluminum. And rather than set this all up at once, let's actually um, kind of do this step by step. So that is 0 0.370 moles of aluminum. And the abbreviation for moles is MOL. Not much of an abbreviation, but all the other stuff is taken. Because M is um, meters, and MO is months. Uh, so MOL is the best we can do. So now that means we have about a third of a mole of aluminum. 
Okay, about a third of that big number of aluminum atoms. So now if we want to know uh, how many actual atoms of aluminum are in that sample, we use this relationship from above and say, all right, well, we know that there are this, this many particles in each mole. So if we have this many moles, we multiply it by that many particles per one mole. So we've got one mole on the bottom. Do that calculation, and you end up with 2.23 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of aluminum. All right. Which is about a third of a mole, because we know a mole is six. So a little over a third, a third of that would be two, uh, and a little over that is 2.23. And that's kind of this, this bold thing that's next. Always make sure that that number makes sense. If you end up with a number that seems like way too big or way too small or something, go back and check your work. Um, I see that a lot. The, I know it's easy to kind of just remember formulas or something like that, and it can be really useful too. But if you remember it wrong or you happen to flip something, you're probably going to get an answer out that makes no sense. So just get out of like formula mode and actually think about it. Does this seem reasonable? If something's asking you for a number of atoms or then you know that that's going to be a pretty enormous number, right? 10 grams, which is, a, which is like something you can hold in your hand, you know there's going to be a huge number of atoms in it. And so if you don't get a really huge number like that, then you, you probably flipped one of your things somewhere, so go back and check that out. I noticed that in some of the stuff in the, um, on the first quiz, like the temperature conversions. Um, you know, some people got like way off temperature conversions. Like, I think, you know, you read that the thing was like 36 degrees C, and then plugged it in and got that that was like 400 degrees F or something. Um, which, you know, if you then looked at that, you should think, wait, that can't be right. I got to go back and fix that. And maybe you didn't have time or whatever. But that's always an important thing when you're doing these problems is to go back and say, does this answer really seem reasonable? It still might not be right, but it does it at least seem reasonable? And if not, you know you can go back and, and recheck it. Okay, so now your turn. Given 5.02 milligrams of gold, how many moles of material are there? And then how many atoms of gold are there in this number? So here's how I want you to do it. Do it yourself. See what you can do. Take about a couple minutes. Follow the same procedure as above. And then turn to the person next to you or on either side and see what they got and compare your answers and see where you might have agreed or disagreed. So I got... Five point oh two milligrams of gold. And we first have to convert this to grams, but I'm going to show you a little trick about that shortly. And then grams per mole. So we've got grams on the bottom and moles on the top. Uh, for gold, that's going to be 197 grams per one mole. And note that after these, you know, soon, uh, you won't be given these little hints like that gold is AU in parentheses. So you need to make sure, remember, keep working on those names so you know what those are. All right, and then once you've got moles, you can convert to atoms. And if you do all that, I believe you get something like 0.5. Oh, wait, it's asking both things, so let's get both things. So for just the moles, we've got 2.55 times 10 to the minus 5 moles. Does that look right? 
And then for the atoms, um, we got, actually I don't have that one. What did what, you guys get? 1.53 times 10 to the 19th atoms. Does that make sense? Does it seem to work? OK, good. All right, now what do you do about milligrams? Um, you can always convert to grams. So if you like doing that, you're going to keep doing that. Continue to do that and ignore what I'm about to say. When we're using small quantities, especially like in organic chemistry in the labs, you'll see we almost never use more than a gram because it just creates a lot of waste. So if you're always dealing with milligrams, you can actually uh, measure it instead in millimoles rather than in moles. So like in this case, I'm going to put a little sidebar here. If we did the same thing, but we just multiply by this number here, we now have actually milligrams oops, not AG, AU, per millimole, right? It's the same thing. We're just basically um, dividing by 1,000 for everything. So we have milla things instead of standard things. So instead of grams, we have milligrams. Instead of moles, we have millimoles. And then the answer we would get, 0 0.0255 is in millimoles rather than moles. And so that's OK, too. If you don't want to deal with the scientific notation and all that, and you're dealing with milligrams, it's often um, convenient to express things in millimoles instead of regular moles. More than a gram, we usually use, uh, I guess it goes either way. But, but if you've got things in milligrams, you can often use millimoles. If that seems confusing, you don't want to mess with it, don't worry about it. And you would accept either answer? Yeah, if I asked you how many moles are in something and you report that in millimoles, that's fine. Um, in multiple choice, that wouldn't be true, but it should be clear, you know, you wouldn't really have that option anyway. It's also a nice way just to get practice in your brain going between these different types of units. Milla is always, you know, a thousandth of the normal one. So you should be able to go back and forth fairly quickly. All right, so we've talked about molar mass in terms of atoms, but we can also talk about molar mass in terms of molecules or other substances. Um, and this can, this can be really whatever, the mass per mole of any material. You could have a molar mass of donuts, right? The amount in mass that one mole of donuts would weigh. It's going to be a huge number, but that's also a molar mass. And this is something that you absolutely need to do, or need to be able to do. Uh, luckily, it's, it's really not that hard. So here's how you do it. If you want to know the number of grams in one mole of water, that means one mole of water molecules, what do you do, those of you who have done this before? Yeah, you just get your numbers and you add them up based on how many atoms are in there. So this, this molecular formula, H2O, tells us that there are two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, right? So we take that, take the mass of each one, we add them up. You can do these, you can kind of do it out the long way. So we can say the mass of hydrogen is 1.01 gram per mole. So that's 1.01 plus 1.01. And then oxygen is 16.0. Uh, right, we add all those up and get 18.0 grams per mole, which means 18 grams in one mole of water. So if you weigh out 18 grams of water on your balance, you have exactly one mole, which means you have exactly 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of water. And why don't you try that with these other ones now? Now when they get big, it's usually helpful. I'm going to jump down and do one more example, actually, before I, I let you go. Um, we're going to look at acetone here. As you get more of these numbers, it's going to get a little tedious to just keep adding them up in a big line. So why not set yourself up a little multiplication slash addition problem? I usually just do it like this. So I've got the three carbons. That's 3 times 
We've got the six hydrogens, that's six times 1.01. .01. And we've got the one oxygen, that's one times 16.0. Add all those up and see what you get, all right? So see if you can get all those and we'll, we'll see if we've got all the answers that agree with each other. Finish these up later. Uh, what'd you get for NaCl? 58 point something. I don't know. 59. Okay, that's fine. What about calcium carbonate? About 100. Uh, the acetone, would that come out to? Uh, what about the caffeine? All right, maybe we'll recheck that one. Acetaminophen? Okay, good. So, uh, looks like that's, that's going okay. Please, please, please be sure to be able to do this. Um, you'll have to do this a lot throughout, not just this semester, but pretty much any class, science class you do, you have to do this. So I'm just going to warn you right now. This is the part that most people don't like. Uh, I'm not going to say that. People don't like a lot of this stuff. <laughs> this, is, this is up there on the list, though. Uh, this is the one time in the semester, I think, that there's really, like, all you can really do is just brute force memorization to get this thing done. And for some of you, that's great because you're good at that and you've, you've done it in biology classes and that kind of stuff. So that's awesome. For other people, it'll just drive you up a wall. But, you know, do your best and I'm going to try to help you through it and give you the tricks to get it um, in the easiest way possible. But the main thing that we're going to look at here is some things about the periodic table and this will all kind of lead to naming. We have to be able to name chemical compounds so that we know what we're talking about to each other. If we're in lab and I say, hey, you need some ferric chloride, you need to know that that's FeCl3 because the label might not say ferric chloride, it might say FeCl3. Or if you're doing a calculation and the thing in the lab says, make sure to use some, um, I don't know, Blank. Use some uh, silicon dioxide, you need to know that that's SiO2 so that you can calculate the molar mass and that kind of thing. So this is all going to kind of lead up to how do we name these compounds so we know what each other are talking about when we talk about chemicals. This is also one of the things that I think stretches beyond this class a little bit because whether or not you become a chemist or go into science or whatever, you're going to encounter a lot of chemicals and it's going to help if you sort of know how to talk about them. So. Um, this first categorization seems a little not necessary, but actually this will help greatly in determining how things are named. So depending on what falls into what category, it'll, have a, it'll be named a certain way that we'll see momentarily. Um, so first, we're going to separate the periodic table into two rough groups, the metals and the non-metals. Anybody know approximately where that division is in the periodic table? Yeah, you see that sort of darkened black line between boron and aluminum that kind of stair steps down? That's your rough division. And I say rough because um, it's not super strict. But basically, and we'll talk about some of those exceptions, but basically everything to the left of that is a metal and everything to the right of that is a non-metal with some other things that we'll find. The reason that's important is because of the compounds that they form. Generally, Metals tend to lose electrons, so they tend to become positive ions or cations. They tend to form ionic compounds. And then the nonmetals over to the right, generally, again, not always, but generally, l gain electrons, form anions, and make both ionic and covalent bonds. So when a, when a metal and a nonmetal come together, they're usually forming an ionic substance. Remember, just positive and negative ions that attract each other. When two nonmetals come together, or, or more nonmetals come together, they usually form covalent compounds. And that's going to have some consequences in naming. So do I have a, I don't have a picture. Let me show you this picture uh, from the book. So 
So remember, we had that classification tree before, where we had pure substances, and then we had mixtures, and heterogeneous, and homogeneous, and all that stuff. This is just the pure substances side. And before, we just broke it down into uh, sort of two things, elements and compounds. Now we're going to break it down one more level. Because elements can either be atomic or molecular. What does that mean? Well, that means that an atomic substance that is just a pure element, I'm sorry, uh, an element, a pure element, can either exist as individual atoms or as bonded groups of atoms called molecules. So neon, for instance, exists as just free individual atoms. But oxygen exists as O2, which is, an, is a molecule of two oxygen atoms. So that's still an element because there's no other atoms in there. It's just oxygen. But it's a molecular element, not an atomic element. And that's important for things like molar mass calculations. Because if I said, what's the molar mass of an oxygen molecule, um, you'd need to know that that's actually two oxygens, O2, not just O. On the other side of that, we have compounds. And you have the molecular ones and the ionic ones. And in terms of calculation, there's not much difference there. But in terms of naming them, there's going to be a big difference. So one thing you're going to be, have to be able to do is determine whether a compound is, mo is molecular or is ionic, whether it's a molecule or whether it's an ionic solid. And that will affect the naming. Now, a couple things that we can be pretty certain of. Alkali metals, that's the group all the way over to the left, hydrogen on down. Those tend to always form, I wouldn't say tend, these form one plus ions. They don't, tend to, they don't form other ions uh, except in very extreme, unusual situations. So you could pretty much bet that if you have lithium in a compound, it's going to be lithium plus, plus one. If you have sodium, it's going to be sodium plus one, et cetera. The alkaline earth metals are the ones right next door. And those tend to lose two electrons to form two plus ions. And that's a pretty fair bet, too. So you can be pretty sure about that. And then halogens, over all the way on the right, that's fluorine down through iodine, generally tend to form one minus ions. So they gain one electron. That one's a little, that's only when they're in ionic compounds, generally. Has anybody heard of these? The nictides or the calcogens or calcogenides? Those are less common um, names. You don't really have to know those. But the nictides are group 5 there, group 5A or 15. That's nitrogen through bismuth. Actually, technically, nitrogen doesn't count. It's phosphorus through bismuth, but that's fine. And the calcogens are the next row over, oxygen through tellurium. We don't usually talk about polonium, PO, or acetine, 85, uh, AT, in these families because those are radioactive and they don't actually have those same um, properties, so we usually just ignore them. And then one of those questions from your lovely exam that we did at the very beginning, you have um, periods going across, right? groups going down, periods going across. So first period is hydrogen helium, second period is right and so you'll notice in that second period that really lithium beryllium or metals boron carbon nitrogen oxygen fluorine neon are nonmetals so there's a clear break there uh, in the third period then you've got sodium I'm going to write these down you've got uh, sodium Magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, argon. Starting to get used to these names, getting the symbols down a little bit. There's a break here, but the break is a little bit different. It's between aluminum. Aluminum has more metallic properties, which you know if you've seen like aluminum foil or pieces of aluminum. It looks metal, it's shiny, it's you know malleable and all that. And then silicon is not, although it has some properties, it's not really metallic, so that it falls more on the nonmetal side. So depending on where things are in the periodic table, you can make some um, predictions about how they're going to behave, and that's kind of why it's laid out. 
When we get into several chapters later, we'll talk about why it's laid out the way it is. Um, but for now, you can just say, you can just know that because things are in certain positions, they'll have certain properties, and we can use that. All right, so let's get into some of these names. First of all, common names. Common names are kind of a pain. Common names usually have no systematic nature to them at all, which means there's no way to look at something and figure out its common name. It's just a thing that was named. It usually comes from like where it was found or what it was originally used for or named after somebody who found it. So things like saltpeter, right, potassium nitrate, uh, Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate, laughing gas. What's that? I know. Nitrous oxide, N2O. Yeah. Grain alcohol, what's grain alcohol? That's the old common name for ethanol. Um, wood alcohol, I believe, is methanol. Isopropyl alcohol is also known as rubbing alcohol. So there's all these like common names you know, that you might see at the store. Um, mineral spirits or something like that. There's really no way to know those unless you just know them. So we're not going to focus on really learning them, but the ones that are really, really common, you'll probably just get because we use them a lot. Um, and I'll be more specific if there's something that I really want you to know a common name of. But primarily, we're going to use the systematic names, which are names that we, that we follow rules to get to. And therefore, everybody always knows what everybody else is talking about because there's only one way to name that particular thing in this particular way. All right. We'll start easy, and we'll get a little trickier and a little trickier. And the easiest ones, I think, are the binary ionic compounds. So what does it mean for a compound to be binary? Two what, you think? Two different elements, yeah. Compounds composed of two different elements are known as binary compounds. So first we're going to look at the binary ionic compounds. So you have to figure out, in, or in order to figure this out, you have to know that a molecule or a substance compound gets in this category. Once you know that, then the name is pretty easy. So let's look at some examples. Here are some ionic compounds, some binary ionic compounds. I'm just going to list them, and then we're going to see uh, if we can name them together. So here are your rules, two rules. Cation, then anion. So that's the order. And then a cation takes its name from the name of the element. So if your cation is sodium, it's simply named sodium. All right. So sodium in this case is called Na plus is sodium. Now, do you have to know that sodium is Na plus in this compound to know that uh, its name is sodium? No doesn't matter what that little charge is. It's just sodium. And then an anion is named by taking the root of the element name and adding ide. Ide. So N3 minus is called, what do you think? What do you think N3 minus is? Nitride. Because it's nitrogen, we take off the ogen and we add ide. All right, so let's try some of these. These ones we drew before, what would you call that, the first one? Sodium chloride. What about this one? Potassium sulfide. Yep. There's no, remember, no prefixes or any bi, di, mono. We'll get to that stuff later. It's just the name of each one. What about this one? Calcium oxide. Aluminum oxide or aluminum oxide, if you prefer the... Um, <laughs> British version. Uh, what about this one? Strontium fluoride, right. And what about this one? Yep. Selenide, yeah, from selenium.
All right, so those are the easiest, because you don't have to worry about the numbers or anything. It's just, you name the cation, you name the anion with i, done. And these are these little kind of shortcuts from your book to remember everything, and they have them all laid out in the back. So if you're trying to remember this, that might be a good reference. All right, well, now we have to get a little trickier. Not too much trickier, but a little bit trickier. Type 2 binary ionic compounds are compounds when the cation can have more than one oxidation state or charge. That's that little number on top, how many electrons it's missing is what that refers to. So we talked about things in those first two rows, and aluminum also fits that, that um, bill, but most other elements don't. And those are atoms or elements that only really form one cation. So the first group, that first column, they all form just plus one. The second one all forms plus two. And aluminum forms plus three. Other ones are not that easy to say because they, get, they have multiple different possible uh, ions. So like all of these ones in the middle called transition metals, those can all have different types of um, uh, charges on their ions. So we need to have names that indicate which one it is. And that's where the next one comes in. So for example, iron. Iron has two common ions, iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus. So it can make two different compounds with a 1 minus chloride, FeCl2 and FeCl3. And we need to be able to name those differently so we can distinguish them. And here's the um, systematic way of naming it. You take the name of the metal, and then in parentheses, the charge in Roman numerals in parentheses. So for this one, the first one, we would say iron 2 chloride. And for this one up here, we would say iron 3 Chloride. And that tells us very specifically and unambiguously which one we're talking about. Now there's another way to name this too, um, an older way, more of a common, it's, it's almost like a common name, but these are ones that you should be able to use. And that's ending things with ick or us. If it just has two common states, like iron does, the one with the higher charge gets a suffix of ick. And the one with the lower charge gets an ending of us. So you can have um, now two different compounds. The, the, the confusing thing about this is they, these also tend to use their old names for the element. So we don't call it ironic or ironous. We call it ferric or ferrous, coming from the older names of those. So an Fe3 plus ion, an iron 3 ion, is known as a ferric ion. So FeCl3. Is ferric chloride, and then the two, the uh, the iron two ion is known as a ferrous ion. So FeCl two would be called ferrous chloride. So let's try a couple of these, and we're going to look at both names, both the um, systematic name and this ick us type name. So see if you can do these um, first, and then we'll talk about them. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of guessing involved on your part, but see what you can do in terms of these copper ions, or these copper compounds, and these mercury compounds, based on those rules that we just talked about. So let's, let's at least get those first names in here. So this one's going to be copper 1. How did I know that that was copper 1? Well, there's one chlorine, right? And we know that chloride is always a minus one charge. And this is one of the reasons why it's really important to um, learn your ions. Remember that big list of ions that I scared you with the very first day? You have to know those because it's going to affect the naming. You need to know the, ch the identities and the charges of these different ions so you can do this. So this other one, then, is copper. 2 
chloride. All right. Now, n using these other um, kind of traditional names for these, what do you think you would call the first one? Yeah, this becomes cuprous. chloride, and this becomes cupric chloride. Okay. What about these next two? Yeah, this is going to be mercury 1. chloride, and this is going to be mercury 2 chloride. And even though this is one that does have an unusual symbol, Hg, the, um, the name still comes, still is mercury. So this becomes mercurous chloride and mercuric chloride, mercuric. Um, no, I think you definitely need the Roman numeral one. Absolutely, you need to know that. Mm -hmm. The other ones, you should have an idea of what that is because it'll come up in lab and stuff. But um, I probably won't test it much just outright just because there's so many different weird things to learn there. So focus on your other ions um, and, and just make sure you can do it. If you can do the Roman numeral thing, you'll be good because that's the standard way of doing this. That's the correct way of doing it. The other way, you'll certainly see, um, but I don't think you need to necessarily have that in your head right now. All right, a couple exceptions. We always like exceptions. There's always a lot of them. They're not really exceptions. They're just ones that only form one particular charge, so we don't use the number, even though they, they're in the middle. And those are silver and zinc. Silver always forms a one plus charge. So we don't say silver one chloride, we just say silver chloride, because there's only one of them. And zinc only ever forms a two plus charge, so we don't say zinc two chloride, we just say zinc chloride, again, because there's only one of them. All right. Now comes the part that no one likes. The polyatomic ions. Ions that have many atoms. There's really no way to identify these except to just know what they are. And that's why I gave you that table um, in the notes. So if you haven't started setting that yet, please go to it. Something like NH4OH, the only way you could possibly name this is by recognizing that it is made up of two distinct ions. Ammonium on the left, which has a one plus charge, and hydroxide on the right, which has a one minus charge. So these are named just like the type one that we saw earlier that were easy. You just say the name of both ions. But you need to know what those ions are, and you need to know what their charges are. So there's really no trick to that way of getting around it. You just have to know that list. So, yes, that list that says anions to know on Blackboard. There's no ammonium there, isn't it? There isn't? All right. Yeah, ammonium is the only positively charged polyatomic one that you're going to need to know. Yeah, it's plus one. Ammonium is NH4 plus. So knowing that, well, how would you name the next one? Ammonium chloride, right. What about the next one? That's calcium carbonate. Calcium ion, carbonate ion. 
Uh, what about the next one? Ammonium nitrate, and then? Potassium nitrate, and? Sodium sulfate. Right. So those are, the, those are some of the more common ones. Um, make sure that you certainly know those, but you'll also ne need to know some of the less common ones, like sulfite and nitrite and nitride and whatever else is on there, azide, all that kind of stuff, chlorate. All right, now we're going to talk about ones that you can actually figure out a little bit, that you don't just have to memorize. And it actually cuts down that list significantly. And that's the oxoanions, so anions that contain uh, oxygen. You can guess the prefix based on the number of oxygen atoms present in the ion, but you have to know one of them because it's a relative thing. It's not, it's not always the same. So you have to memorize one from the list of each element, and then you can figure out the rest of them. Let me show you how that works. Here are the chlorine oxoanions. So anions that contain oxygen and chlorine. ClO3 minus, that's the one I would memorize, is chlorate. If you add an oxygen, you get perchlorate. If you subtract an oxygen, you get chlorite. And if you subtract another oxygen, you get hypochlorite. Right? And if you look at kind of the bottom of your list, there's a bunch of them like that. Iodate, iodite, hypoiodite, that kind of stuff. If you just know one of those, you can figure out the rest by adding or subtracting oxygens and remembering the order. So the order goes per has the most oxygen, then eight, then ite, then hypoite. If you know those, then you can figure out the rest. For instance, sulfate is SO4, 2 minus. Sulfite is SO3, 2 minus. So if you knew that, if you knew the 8, then the ite must have one fewer oxygen. So that helps a little bit, maybe. You do what I can. It's a lot of memorization. There's nothing you can really do about that. All right. So let's see, we got about, what, 10 minutes? Four. Four? Are we 10.45? Okay, let's stop there and we'll, we'll get into these next.